Introduction ideas aren't cheap, they're free provocative. Just one word, provocative, until recently, prospective students at All Souls College and Oxford University took a one-word exam. The essay, as it was called, was both anticipated and feared by applicants. They each flipped over a piece of paper at the same time to reveal a single word. The word might have been innocence or miracles or water or provocative. Their challenge was to craft an essay in three hours inspired by that single word. There were no right answers to this exam. However, each applicant's response provided insights into the student's wealth of knowledge and ability to generate creative connections. The New York Times quotes one Oxford professor as saying, the unveiling of the word was once an event of such excitement that even non-applicants reportedly gathered outside the college each year. Waiting for news to waft out one this challenge reinforces the fact that everything, every single word, provides an opportunity to leverage what you know to stretch your imagination. For so many of us, this type of creativity hasn't been fostered. We don't look at everything in our environment as an opportunity for ingenuity. In fact, creativity should be an imperative. Creativity allows you to thrive in an ever-changing world and unlocks a universe of possibilities. With enhanced creativity, instead of problems you see potential. Instead of obstacles you see opportunities. And instead of challenges you see a chance to create breakthrough solutions. Look around and it becomes clear that the innovators among us are the ones succeeding in every arena. From science and technology to education and the arts. Nevertheless, creative problem solving is rarely taught in school or even considered a skill you can learn. Sadly, there is also a common and often repeated saying, ideas are cheap. This statement discounts the value of creativity and is utterly wrong. Ideas aren't cheap at all, they're free, and they're amazingly valuable. Ideas lead to innovations that fuel the economies of the world, and they prevent our lives from becoming repetitive and stagnant. They are the cranes that pull us out of well-worn ruts and put us on a path toward progress. Without creativity, we are not just condemned to a life of repetition, but to a life that slips backward. In fact, the biggest failures of our lives are not those of execution, but failures of imagination. As the renowned American inventor Alan Kay famously said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. We are all inventors of our own future, and creativity is at the heart of invention. As demonstrated so beautifully by the one-word exam, every utterance, every object, every decision, and every action is an opportunity for creativity. This challenge, one of many tests given over several days at All Souls College, has been called the hardest exam in the world. It required both a breadth of knowledge and a healthy dose of imagination. Matthew Edward Harris, who took the exam in 2007, was assigned the word harmony. He wrote in the Daily Telegraph that he felt like a chef rummaging through the recesses of his refrigerator for unlikely soup ingredients to this homey simile is a wonderful reminder that these are skills that we have an opportunity to call upon every day as we face challenges as simple as making soup and as monumental as solving the massive problems that face the world. I teach a course on creativity and innovation at the Hasso Plattner Institute of Design, affectionately called the D. School. Three at Stanford University. This complements my full-time job as executive director of the Stanford Technology Ventures Program. Four in the Stanford School of Engineering. At STVP, our mission is to provide students in all fields with the knowledge, skills, and attitudes needed to seize opportunities and creatively solve major world problems. On the first day of class, we start with a very simple challenge, redesigning a name tag. I tell the students that I don't like name tags at all. The text is too small to read. They don't include the information I want to know, and they're often hanging around the wearer's belt buckle, which is really awkward. The students laugh when they realize that they too have been frustrated by the same problems. Within 15 minutes, the class has replaced the name tags hanging around their necks with beautifully decorated pieces of paper with their names in large text. And the new name tags are pinned neatly to their shirts. They're pleased they have successfully solved the problem and are ready to go on to the next one. But I have something else in mind. I collect all of the new name tags and put them in the shredder. The students look at me as though I have gone nuts. I then ask, why do we use name tags at all? At first, the students think that this is a preposterous question. Isn't the answer obvious? Of course, we use name tags so that others can see our name. They quickly realize, however, that they've never thought about this question. After a short discussion, the students acknowledge that name tags serve a sophisticated set of functions, including stimulating conversations between people who don't know each other, helping to avoid the embarrassment of forgetting someone's name, and allowing you to quickly learn about the person with whom you are talking. With this expanded appreciation for the role of a name tag, Students interview one another to learn how they want to engage with new people and how they want others to engage with them. These interviews provide fresh insights that lead them to create inventive new solutions that push beyond the limitations of a traditional name tag. One team broke free from the size constraints of a tiny name tag and designed custom t-shirts with a mix of information about the wearer in both words and pictures. Featured were the places they had lived, 
the sports they played, their favorite music, and members of their families. They vastly expanded the concept of a name tag. Instead of wearing a tiny tag on their shirts, each shirt literally became a name tag, offering lots of topics to explore. Another team realized that when you meet someone new, it would be helpful to have relevant information about that person fed to you on an as-needed basis to help keep the conversation going and to avoid embarrassing silences. They mocked up an earpiece that whispers information about the person with whom you are talking. It discreetly reveals helpful facts, such as how to pronounce the person's name, his or her place of employment, and the names of mutual friends. Yet another team realized that in order to facilitate meaningful connections between people, it is often more important to know how the other person is feeling than it is to know a collection of facts about them. They designed a set of colored bracelets, each of which denotes a different mood. For example, a green ribbon means that you feel cheerful, a blue ribbon that you are melancholy, a red ribbon that you're stressed, and a purple ribbon that you feel fortunate. By combining the different colored ribbons, a wide range of emotions can be quickly communicated to others, facilitating a more meaningful first connection. This assignment is designed to demonstrate an important point. There are opportunities for creative problem solving everywhere. Anything in the world can inspire ingenious ideas, even a simple name tag. Take a look around your office, your classroom, your bedroom, or your backyard. Everything you see is ripe for innovation. Creativity is an endless renewable resource, and we can tap into it at any time. As children, we naturally draw upon our imagination and curiosity in an attempt to make sense of the complicated world around us. We experiment with everything in our midst, dropping things to see how far they fall, banging things to see how they sound, and touching all the things we can get our hands on to see how they feel. We mix together random ingredients in the kitchen to see how they taste, make up games with our friends, and imagine what it would be like to live on other planets. Essentially, we have both creative competence and confidence, and the adults around us encourage our creative endeavors, building environments that tickle our imagination. As we approach adulthood, we are expected to be serious, to work hard, and to be productive. There is an ever-increasing emphasis on planning and preparing for the future rather than experimenting and exploring in the present. And the spaces in which we work reflect this new focus. With this type of external pressure and messaging, we shut down our natural curiosity and creativity as we strive to deliver what is expected of us. We give up on playing and focus on producing, and we trade in our rich imagination in order to focus on implementation. Our attitude changes and our creative aptitude withers as we learn to judge and dismiss new ideas. The great news is that our brains are built for creative problem solving, and it is easy to both uncover and enhance our natural inventiveness. The human brain evolved over millions of years from a small collection of nerve cells with limited functionality to a fabulously complex organ that is optimized for innovation. Our highly developed brains are always assessing our ever-changing environment, mixing and matching our responses to fit each situation. Every sentence we craft is unique, each interaction we have is distinctive, and every decision we make is done with our own free will. That we have the ability to come up with an endless set of novel responses to the world around us is a constant reminder that we are born to be inventive. Nobel Prize winning neuroscientist Eric Kandel says that the brain is a creativity machine 5. It appears that the quantity and diversity of our ideas are mediated by the frontal lobes, right behind your forehead. Preliminary brain research by Charles Limit Johns Hopkins University shows that the parts of your brain that are responsible for self-monitoring are literally turned off during creative endeavors. He uses functional magnetic resonance imaging, which measures metabolic activity in the different areas of the brain, to study brain activity in jazz musicians and rap artists. While they are in the MRI scanner, he asks the musicians to compose an improvisational piece of music. While they are playing, Lim has found that a part of the brain's frontal lobes believed to be responsible for judgment shows much lower activity 6. This implies that during this creative process, the brain actively shuts off its normal inhibition of new ideas. For many activities, it is important to have high self-monitoring of your behavior so that you don't say everything you think or do everything that you consider. But when you are generating new ideas, this function gets in the way. Creative people have apparently mastered the art of turning off this part of their brains to let their ideas flow more smoothly, unleashing their imagination. The title of this book, Ingenious, reflects the fact that we each have creative genius waiting to be unlocked. The word ingenious is derived from the Latin term ingenium, which means natural capacity or innate talent. For centuries, people have questioned these natural talents and looked outside themselves for the source of creative inspiration. The ancient Greeks believed there were goddesses, called muses, who inspired literature and art. And they worshipped them for their powers seven later. In Elizabethan England, William Shakespeare invoked his muse when writing sonnets often beseeching her for help eight ideas often feel inspired and, therefore, it made sense to beseech a muse for inspiration. 
However, we now know that it is really up to you to ignite your inborn inventiveness. Many people question whether creativity can be taught and learned. They believe that creative abilities are fixed, like eye color, and can't be changed. They think that if they aren't currently creative, there is no way to increase their ability to come up with innovative ideas. I couldn't disagree more. There is a concrete set of methods and environmental factors that can be used to enhance your imagination. And by optimizing these variables, your creativity naturally increases. Unfortunately, these tools are rarely presented in a formalized way. As a result, creativity appears to most people to be something magical rather than the natural result of a clear set of processes and conditions. It might seem counterintuitive to use a set of tools to enhance creativity since creativity necessitates doing things that haven't been done before. But a guide is just what we need. Just as scientists adopt tried and true scientific methods to design experiments, enhancing your creativity benefits from a formal set of tools for idea generation. Consider the fact that we are taught how to use the scientific method from the time we are children. Starting at an early age, we learn how to make hypotheses and to test them in order to discover how the world in which we live works. We learn how to ask probing questions, to unpack all the assumptions, and to design experiments to reveal the answers. This important skill and the associated vocabulary are honed for years until they become quite natural. The scientific method is clearly invaluable when you are trying to unlock the mysteries of the world. However, you need a complementary set of tools and techniques, creative thinking, when you want to invent rather than discover. These two endeavors are completely different, but they work in concert. Like the scientific method, creative thinking uses well-defined tools, demystifies the pathway for invention and provides a valuable framework for creating something new. Successful scientists and innovators in all fields move back and forth between discovery and invention, using both scientific and creative thinking processes. In fact, most great scientists are also accomplished inventors who pose the most innovative question and invent ingenious methods to test their scientific theories. It is time to make creative thinking, just like the scientific method, a core part of our education from the time we are children, and to reinforce these lessons throughout our lives. We already use creative thinking to some degree when we face challenges in all aspects of our lives. Some of these challenges result in quick creative fixes, such as using a shoe to prop open a door, folding over the corner of a page to mark where you left off reading, or using replacements for ingredients you don't have when making dinner. These solutions come so naturally that we don't even think of them as innovative responses to the small problems that surface each day. However, other creative solutions are significant enough to grow into entire industries. Everything we use has been conceived of and invented by someone, including alarm clocks, buttons, card games, cell phones, commercials, condoms, diapers, doorknobs, eyeglasses, food processors, garage sales, hairbrushes, the internet, jackets, jet engines, kites, lasers, matches, measuring cups, movie theaters, nail files, paper clips, pencils, picture frames, radios, rubber bands, socks, toasters, toothbrushes, umbrellas, wine glasses, and zippers. All of these inventions resulted when individuals were faced with a problem or saw an opportunity and created a way to bring their innovation to the world. There are always problems to be solved, improvements to be made, and breakthrough products to be invented. Every new venture begins by addressing a problem or responding to an opportunity and relies upon the creativity of the founders. However, just like individuals, most organizations curb their creative tendencies as they mature, locking down their products and processes, and focusing on execution rather than imagination. Like muscles that atrophy from lack of use, innovation shrivels up when ignored. This is terribly unfortunate. By blindly moving ahead, individuals and organizations fall farther and farther behind those who are able to creatively adapt to the ever-changing environment. Innovative firms know that it is critically important to have people on their teams who can creatively respond to unanticipated challenges. For example, at Google recruiters ask prospective employees questions that test their expertise in the domain in which they will be working, such as software or marketing, as well as questions that require creative thinking. They might ask, how many golf balls would fit in a school bus? How many piano tuners are there in the entire world? Or imagine that you are shrunk to the height of a nickel and are then thrown into an empty glass blender. The blades will start moving in 60 seconds. What do you do? These questions are designed to identify individuals who can solve problems that do not have one correct answer. A number of scientists have tried to formalize a measurement of creativity and have devised tests to calculate your creativity quotient, or CQ. For example, they might look at the number of diverse ideas you generate when given a specific challenge, such as how many things you can do with a single paper clip, a postage stamp, a brick, or a piece of paper. They believe that just as your intelligence quotient is a rough measure of your intelligence, 
This type of measurement is a useful way to evaluate your creativity nine in these types of tests. Some people come up with a few obvious answers, while others generate endless lists of uses for these simple objects. It is assumed that the longer and more diverse your list of uses for a paper clip or a piece of paper, the more likely you are to come up with creative solutions to real-world challenges. From my perspective, this is a fun warm-up exercise, much like stretching before performing a complex gymnastics routine. It is much too simplistic. However, if your goal is to determine whether someone is going to generate creative solutions to real-world problems. In a gymnastics competition, for instance, there is a long list of variables that determine your ability to perform, including your training, your motivation to perform well, and the equipment you are using. Creativity, like gymnastics, is quite complex and is influenced by many factors, such as your knowledge, motivation, and environment. These variables are just as important in determining your creativity as your ability to make a list of things you can do with a paper clip or to shimmy out of a blender. In addition, creativity is a quality not only of individuals, but also of groups, organizations, and entire communities. Therefore, it makes sense to consider all the variables that influence ingenuity, including individual skills and how the environment influences them. My course on creativity is designed to teach students to look at a wide range of factors, both inside themselves and in the outside world, that affect ingenuity. We use many techniques, including workshops, case studies, design projects, simulation games, field trips, and visits from experts who work in highly innovative ventures. Students learn how to polish their powers of observation, practice connecting and combining ideas, and train themselves to challenge their assumptions and reframe problems. They leave with a set of creative thinking tools that facilitate the generation of fresh ideas. During the course, students tackle several different projects, each of which is crafted to focus on another aspect of the creative thinking process. They work in interdisciplinary teams that include students from engineering, science, law, education, business, and the arts. This multidisciplinary approach is critical since most problems we face today require input and insights from those with different backgrounds and perspectives. Students also get exposure to an array of environments that foster creativity and learn how to build ventures that are optimized for innovation. We focus on the variables they have at their disposal to enhance creativity in groups, including redesigning the physical space, changing the rules, and modifying the incentives across the organization. We visit a range of companies to see how their environments influence innovation and students get a chance to interact with the leaders of these firms to learn how they institute practices to enhance creative output. After a dozen years teaching courses on creativity and innovation, I can confidently assert that creativity can be enhanced. The following chapters are filled with details about specific tools and techniques that work well, along with stories that bring them to life. We will look at ways to increase your ability to see opportunities around you, to connect and combine ideas, to challenge assumptions, and to reframe problems. We will explore ways you can modify your physical and social environment to enhance your creativity and the creativity of those with whom you live and work. In addition, we will look at the ways your motivation and mindset influence your creative output, including your willingness to experiment, your ability to push through barriers to find creative solutions to daunting challenges, and your skill at turning off premature judgment of new ideas. It is important to understand that these factors fit together and profoundly influence one another. Therefore, none can be viewed in isolation. I've created a new model, the innovation engine, shown below. That illustrates how all these factors work together to enhance creativity. I chose the word engine because it, like the word ingenious, is derived from the Latin word for innate talent and is a reminder that these traits come naturally to all of us. My goal is to provide a model, a shared vocabulary, and a set of tools that you can use right away to evaluate and increase your own creativity and that of your team, organization, and community. The three parts on the inside of your innovation engine are knowledge, imagination, and attitude. Your knowledge provides the fuel for your imagination. Your imagination is the catalyst for the transformation of knowledge into new ideas. Your attitude is a spark that sets the innovation engine in motion. The three parts on the outside of your innovation engine are resources, habitat, and culture. Resources are all the assets in your community. Habitats are your local environments, including your home, school, or office. Culture is the collective beliefs, values, and behaviors in your community. Like creativity, at first glance the innovation engine might look complex. Over the course of this book, I will take apart the innovation engine and examine its six components. I will then put it back together and show how all the parts work in concert and influence one another to enhance creativity. 
you will find that the innovation engine snaps into focus as we explore each of the components and see how they fit together. I will concentrate on the parts of the innovation engine that you directly control, imagination, knowledge, habitat, and attitude, and you will see that you can set your innovation engine in motion in myriad ways. Chapters 1 to 3 delve into the process of enhancing your imagination by reframing problems, connecting ideas, and challenging assumptions. Chapter 4 focuses on building your base of knowledge by polishing your powers of observation. Chapters 5 to 8 investigate the factors in your habitat that influence your creativity, including space, constraints, incentives, and team dynamics. Chapters 9 and 10 address your attitude by looking closely at your willingness to experiment and your ability to push through challenges to solve problems that seem insurmountable. And Chapter 11 pulls the components back together and shows how all the parts fit together to create a powerful engine for innovation. There is a recurring theme. Creativity is not just something you think about. It is something you do. In the following chapters, you will learn how to jumpstart your innovation engine, and you will fully appreciate that every word, every object, every idea, and every moment provides an opportunity for creativity. It costs nothing to generate amazing ideas, and the results are priceless.